So pictures speak a thousand words. Cartoons disrupt. Cartoons have been disrupting for centuries. In the United States, the first known political cartoon was by a man named Benjamin Franklin, and he sought to disrupt the colonies with this cartoon, trying to bring them together, to work together to become the United States. In the 1800s, the late 1800s in the United States, cartoonists such as Lou Rogers, a woman, were disrupting the culture and the society, trying to change attitudes towards women and let women have the vote, which we got in 1920. So cartoons were disrupting the culture as well. Cartoons tell us about our world. This cartoon was by Reginald Marsh in the 1930s in the New Yorker magazine. And it tells us about who we are, what we're doing, and what we might be doing wrong bringing your child to a lynching. Cartoons not only disrupt or try to disrupt our, our, our culture by using humor and our leaders, um, they also bring us together when we have been disrupted. This cartoon was drawn by Bill Maudlin after JFK, John F. Kennedy was, was assassinated. And then in the 1970s, the cartoonist Herbert Block along with his, his journalist colleagues at the Washington Post, disrupted um, Richard Nixon <laughs> to force him to resign by exposing and holding him accountable for what he was doing or what he had done. So cartoons are, are great disruptors in our culture over the centuries. Now, also cartoons can be problematic. Um, back in 2005, um, this man, Kurt Westergaard, and, and 11 other cartoonists were, um, were invited or they were commissioned to draw the Prophet Muhammad in Denmark. And it became, known the Dan it became known as the Danish cartoon controversy. And I believe in freedom of speech, freedom of expression globally, that everyone has the right to do that. Um, but these cartoons that they drew were misunderstood, were misinterpreted, and were used as a catalyst for uh, destruction, rioting, and, and death. So we know the power of cartoons can be very strong, particularly now in the age of the internet. Similarly, in 2015, 10 years later, cartoonists and some citizens in the United States, cartoonists and editors, I'm sorry, in, in France were murdered because their cartoons in France, the Charlie Hebdo magazine, were misunderstood or misinterpreted, taken the wrong way, and they were murdered for, their, for, the, for drawing. So we know cartoons can be disruptive and they can cause disruption sometimes. The Charlie Hebdo deaths were, were likened to 9-11. This is a drawing by my friend Michelle Kishka, who lives in Israel, um, showing how France felt as strongly about the deaths of the cartoonists in, in France as we felt, as the globe, globe felt about 9-11. Um, about and so our, our own little world of cartooning has been disrupted over the past couple of decades, starting with the Danish cartoon controversy. When I saw on the front page of the New York Times, I saw the word cartoon, which was very rare. You know, cartoons, we were used to being sort of uh, there, but not always on the front page. And now our, cart our work is, is much different than it was. We have to think differently. We have to work differently, I believe. Cartoonists are trying to push against their, their restrictions. This man, Musa Kart from Turkey, is for the second time now he's been jailed in Turkey for drawing cartoons against the Erdogan regime. And, um, Fa Ali Farzat, a Syrian cartoonist, uh, probably about eight years ago, was uh, his hands were broken um, because of the way he drew, because of the things he drew about the Syrian regime, Bashar al-Assad. In our country, as you guys know, we're being, the press is being attacked. We are the enemy of the people. It's alarming, it's shocking. We have free press, but it's being challenged. When 
Donald Trump was running for president in 2016 before the election. We were shocked, we didn't know what to do, how to respond to this person that was running for president and we were all uh, confused. We're still kind of confused. The things he said, the things he said he was going to do, the things he might do, the things he did do when he was running for president were shocking. And this actually, this cartoon was very difficult to draw because I, I think I embody my cartoonists, my cartoon characters. And so drawing this was, was I felt violated actually. Um, this was after he spoke on that bus about um, groping women. So it was a difficult time in 2016 and then it became even more difficult when he was elected. I, as a cartoonist, decided to pull back a little bit uh, and, and give him a chance um, to try to see what would happen. Because I'm an I'm a, I'm a optimist. I, I try to think positively. And I didn't want to come out of the gate with this presidency being so negative. So I, it was very difficult to be in his shadow as a cartoonist. Many of my colleagues were going to town on his, on his candidacy and on his presidency, trying to speak to what was going on. Um, and many people say to me, uh, now during this presidency, during this administration, it must be a lot of fun. And, I, and it's not fun. It's confusing and it's, it's difficult um, to try to speak to, to what's going on without constantly being just ridiculing. These are some of the cartoonists that are friends of mine in the United States responding to the presidency. But I believe, um, and I still believe that, I'm holding, holding on to it strongly, that our, our system of government, our checks and balances is going to win in the end that we'll have a government that is still functioning and that is still going to do the right thing in the, in, in, the, in the final word. Even though our president is doing all kinds of things across the globe that confuse us and anger us. This is the Paris Accords about the environment. He's um, partnering with people. This is the Saudi Arabia prince and, the, and uh, a cartoon I did about the Yemeni war. And his, and his foreign policy is, is quite disruptive. <laughs> he's not behaving, the president is not behaving quite like we're used to. Um, he's partnering with, with people. This was during the um, Singapore summit um, and now things have gone really wrong. Uh, we're just not sure what's going to happen next and we don't really know who's in charge. Is it Putin at the Oval Office desk or is it, is it Trump under the desk? Another thing that, that this time in our country is, is what, what's happening is that the ramifications, the, 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 the trickling down of, of the attitude in the, in the White House is, is affecting um, our everyday lives, I think, and the way people behave with one another. Um, the Kavanaugh hearings, we had a Supreme Court nominee um, being interviewed for the job and he found out that he was uh, accused in high school of assaulting a young woman. Um, it was turned out not to be proven, um, but I think it, it heightened our awareness of the difficulty of, t of talking about and prosecuting and proving um, things like sexual assault and interactions between genders. So it, it, on the one hand, it created a lot of conversation. It also created a lot of tension and heightened anger. Um, Kavanaugh was, was subsequently confirmed as Supreme Court um, Justice. So there's a, there's a cloud over the White House now and there's been, it's been there for since he was, pretty much since he was uh, sworn into office. Um, and many people are hopeful that his time is, is going to be up soon, that he'll leave office uh, after we have an election in 2020. Because it feels like he's on a precipice of something. We're not sure what's going to happen. If you're aware, we had the Mueller report. The special prosecutor was, was hired to look into Trump's interaction, or sorry, the Trump campaign's interaction with Russians. We know that Russia interfered with our elections, but to what extent the administration was involved with, with it, we don't know. 
and it hasn't been proven yet. But we had a special prosecutor, Robert Mueller, um, spend two years quietly behind the scenes. We never heard a word from him. I don't even know what he sounds like. Um, looking into what what happened. And the Mueller report, many people um, were, were praying that he would answer all our questions about what happened and what's going on um, with, with the Russians and with uh, the administration. The Mueller report came out um, and before anybody could see it, our Attorney General read a, uh, a statement or a summary of the report and um, and he said in the report there was no collusion between Russia and the Trump administration and there was no, there was no crime. But that was his summary of the, of the 400 page report, which was, his summary was maybe three pages. Um, and um, Dianne Feinstein, one of our Democratic senators, questioned Attorney General Barr. He was, he was interviewed, on, uh, had a hearing on Washington recently and I live drew it um, from my TV. And, um, she believes we need to hear from Mueller, hear really what the report said. We've, we've seen the report now, but much of it is redacted. And actually, when the report came out, um, this is Kamala Harris, who is also a senator from California, believes that uh, Barr was not telling the truth, that there's something in there that, that we don't know about. Um, and Mueller actually said to, uh, in a conversation on the phone, in a, in a letter to Attorney General that, there was um, that his report, that his summary of the report did not reflect the content, nature, or substance of the report. So people feel that Barr is, was, was misleading the American public. The Attorney General was misleading the American public and acting more like the president's attorney than the country's attorney. So, Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump are at, at loggerheads with each other. Our, our executive branch and our, and our um, uh, legislative branch are battling. She calls it a constitutional crisis. When we had an election two, a year and a half ago, we, we elected a lot of women to Congress, which was really exciting. Um, and I thought this was D Donald Trump's worst nightmare. That it was just a dream. Go back to sleep, Donald, it was just a dream. They're not monsters, they're just members of Congress. But during his State of the Union address, he, he acknowledged the women in the room, the, the increased number of women in the room, and Nancy Pelosi did as well. She sits behind him during the State of the Union address. So things are just changing a lot. And um, we still have a lot of cultural change to do, running for office, women still are, are judged by how they look and how they, how they wear their hair, and how they speak. Um, we still have a Me Too problem. This, I believe, is a global issue that needs to be addressed everywhere. And of course, in the United States, you all are very aware we have a gun problem, shooting almost every other day, a mass shooting. So a lot of issues, and now there's abortion on the, on, the, on the docket. I don't have any cartoons about that for today, but there's a big, big to-do about um, states bringing back anti-abortion legislation. But we have an election coming up. This is a live drawing I did of a polling place in, in Ohio. And these are our candidates for the Democratic, uh, Democratic uh, Convention. The, the, these are the people that want to be president. And actually, since I drew that about a week ago, there's three more people added to the list. So we have a lot of people running for office. And everybody thinks, well, Joe Biden is, the, is our savior, right? He's gonna, he's gonna rule the day. We don't know. Every, no, you never know what's gonna happen. And we're hoping that people will decide to move away from Trump. But you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I believe there have been times in our history of our country where things have been almost as bad as this. Um, so I, I have hope that we're gonna pull through this. And this constitutional crisis will, will, will right itself and we'll be back on track. And I think since our, our world is so loud now, we're all yelling at each other. Um, there's something, the skills that I use as, as a cartoonist, as a live drawer can help uh, not only me cope with the changes, but also can help all of us cope. As a cartoonist, I've learned that it's best to wait. 
to not react immediately to what's going on. And I think that's true of everybody. We're all so used to being knee-jerk react to, to the news and get angry and yell at each other. There's so much yelling going on. So I've learned to, I've learned to wait, just wait, not react immediately. I've learned, of course, to watch closely, to observe closely, to see people, to really see people. And then I've learned to listen. We need to listen to each other and stop talking immediately and learn how to, to listen, watch, and wait. And I think if we do that on a daily basis, we might, we might, we might get through this together. I believe that cartoons are, at least for me, they're, they're a communication tool. Cartooning is all about communication. It's all about dialogue. It's all about exchanging ideas. That's what I do when I live draw. I'm talking to my, to my friends out there, my followers. And so if we can exchange and talk to each other and understand what's going on in our countries, then maybe we can, we can get through this thing together. No matter what our flags look like, we're all just people. So thank you very much and have a great day.